I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this parliament meets and pay my respect to their elders past and present. In December 2007, the government changed. When you change the government, you do change the nation. And uh, after my appointment as Leader of the House, I was very honoured to be in a position of having discussions as part of uh, that Rudd Labor Cabinet about the timetable for Parliament's resumption. And it was determined uh, with the support, of course, and leadership of the Prime Minister and in particular as well the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, Jenny Macklin, that the Parliament should indeed begin with the apology to the stolen generations. At the time, of course, this had followed years of indecision, years in which Prime Minister Howard said that it would be inappropriate for the parliament to apologise. It was argued that those who would deliver that apology were not personally responsible for taking Indigenous children from their parents over the previous decades. The events of that momentous day show how wrong that view was. It was certainly the proudest day of the 20 two years I'll celebrate as a member of this parliament this coming Friday. It was the day when we, as a parliament, righted a wrong. It was the day when, after years of denial, the parliament recognised the injustices and inhumanity visited upon the stolen generations. Those who were there that day will all remember it. This was a time where the nation paused to reflect our history. And indeed, that day made history. I want to pay tribute in particular to the generosity of the stolen generations themselves who came to this parliament, sat around that chamber, and weren't bitter about their experience, accepted the spirit in which the apology was given by Prime Minister Rudd on behalf of the nation. I looked up as the Prime Minister spoke and I saw scores of members of the stolen generation weeping, sitting in their seats trembling, holding each other's hands, I've seen since, of course, the depiction of meetings out on the front lawn, but right around our nation, where the response was the same. My son's then primary school stopped to watch this historic event on a large screen. The members of the stolen generation that day received just a little bit of warm-hearted uh, response that helped make them feel as though the nation understood in a small way the incredible trauma that had been done to them. It will indeed be remembered for a very long time. As Prime Minister Rudd said, for the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants, and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture we say sorry. As the speech continued, everyone in the parliament knew that we were doing the right thing, as did the millions of Australians gathered around the nation. 
And indeed, when Prime Minister Rudd finished that address around the nation as well as in the chamber, they leapt to their feet to applaud. Of course, the apology was not the end of the story, it was just the beginning. We knew at the time that the apology needed to be backed up with concrete action, that it was just a step on the road to reconciliation. Importantly, establishing the Closing the Gap report to Parliament uh, was an important step forward. Some progress has been made in three out of the seven targets. They include child mortality rates to halve the gap in mortality rates for Indigenous children under five within a decade. Early education that 95 per cent of all Indigenous four-year-olds would be enrolled in early education by 2025. Year 12 attainment, halving the gap in year 12 attainment by 2020. Not on track is life expectancy, employment, reading and writing, and school attendance. I was somewhat disappointed by some of the reporting and public discussion of the Prime Minister's report to Parliament on closing the gap because there was a tone of pessimism. That, I believe, is a wrong analysis. It will take generations to close the gap, indeed decades of bipartisanship. Let me quote Prime Minister Rubb when he spoke uh, at the National Press Club just last month. He said this, these targets were meant to be ambitious. They were meant to challenge us all because we had to shake ourselves out of our national torpor, that business as usual was fine, or we could just fiddle at the edges of Indigenous disadvantage. Mr Rubb went on to say that while we must accept our failures and act to correct them, we must also celebrate our progress. Because of closing the gap, more Indigenous children are finishing school. Because of closing a gap, fewer infants are dying. And because of closing the gap, more youngsters are receiving early childhood education. We have a long way to go, but we can't give up. We have a responsibility to the first Australians, as privileged as we are to live in the nation with the oldest continuous civilisation on the planet, to close the gap across the board so that these issues of education and health and employment and life expectancy are all dealt with. The apology and closing the gap are also critical to the achievement of broader reconciliation. This requires collaboration. It requires that we listen to Indigenous people. And hence the importance of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This calls for a voice to the parliament. And who could disagree with the concept that Indigenous Australians are entitled to put forward their view about legislation before this parliament that impacts them? What they are not asking for is a third chamber. They are asking for a voice to the parliament. And it was very pleasing that Labor has said uh, that we will work towards achieving just that. I'd ask the Prime Minister to reconsider the rejection of the Uluru Statement. It is important that these issues be bipartisan. We must engage with Indigenous people who have gone through a process of consultation with communities around the nation and not just dismiss them and certainly not, certainly not misrepresent what they are asking for. We have a long way to go, Mr Deputy Speaker, to achieve reconciliation in this country. But the apology was an important step. It's one that I'm proud, as a member of the House of Representatives, to be associated with. And it has been very important that we have signified the 10th anniversary of this historic occasion.